Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar today on AlphaGal, the red meat allergy panel. Of course, AlphaGal is much more than a red meat allergy. It is a complex syndrome that is often mischaracterized as a red meat allergy by the general public, clinicians, and even many in the tick-borne diseases community who may have no direct experience with AlphaGal. The purpose of this panel is to provide information on AlphaGal to expand, to expand current knowledge and to offer interesting discussions with new conclusions, perspectives, and ideas being put forward throughout the event. My name is Adina Berkowitz, and I am the founder and executive director of Lyme TV, a public health nonprofit with a mission of preventing dangerous tick-borne diseases. I will be your moderator today. It is an honor to collaborate with such outstanding speakers for today's event. I'm excited to learn from our presenters, each with unique perspectives from a variety of diverse backgrounds. They each add value to the discussion in their own particular way on this very unusual and complex syndrome that can lead to anaphylaxis from a tick bite. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that we do have a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to type your questions there during the presentation with the, pre with the presenter's name that you'd like to address. At the end of the discussions, we will circle back and uh, go through our Q&A session. Additionally, this webinar has the live transcript closed captioning option available um, and enabled for those who need that accessibility requirement. At this time, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists before we begin our discussion. Dr. Tina Merritt is a practicing allergist and immunologist in Arkansas and has been in practice for more than 20 years. Dr. Merritt is known as the mother of AlphaGal in the United States for her research on AlphaGal, an allergy related to tick bites. She worked with Dr. Thomas Platz Mills to develop a test to evaluate these allergic reactions. Researchers at mClone determined that a reaction from a patient um, during a chemo session was an allergy to a sugar protein whose complex chemical name is abbreviated now as alpha-gal. A landmark article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine describing this new type of allergic reaction. Dr. Merritt continues her passion to help those with alpha-gal syndrome through many avenues, including her participation with the Arkansas Alpha-Gal Task Force. Dr. Merritt will be discussing today the current state of alpha-gal from a clinical perspective. Mr. Jan Zellner has, um, has been the director of Science for Lyme TV since its inception, and his work focuses on the epidemiology of tick-borne diseases. Jan completed his PhD dissertation at Columbia University, which focused on quantitative modeling of infectious diseases in the context of historical epidemiology. His work on smallpox in the Roman Empire continues to be widely influential in understanding the demographic history of the period. Jan served on the Department of Defense's fiscal year 2021 congressionally directed medical research programs, tick-borne disease research program as a scientific panel consumer reviewer. And he will be discussing today the epidemiological knowns and unknowns of AlphaGal. Dr. Jennifer Platt has decades of experience in public health and environmental program development. While working on her doctorate in public health from the University of North Carolina, Dr. Platt contracted ehrlichiosis. She was later confirmed to also have Lyme disease and Babesia. Dr. Platt's personal experience with tick-borne illness led her to create Tick Warriors in 2016, which provides eco-friendly tick protection for people, pets, and property. The pervasive need for education and awareness led Dr. Platt to co-found Tick-Borne Conditions United in 2018 with Beth Carrison. She was appointed in 2021 to the Federal Tick-Borne Disease Working Group Clinical Presentation and Pathogenesis Subcommittee. 
Dr. Platt will be discussing the history of advocacy for alpha-gal and the current state of alpha-gal with the tick-borne disease working group. Beth Carrison has over 30 years of experience in business development and healthcare patient advocacy. Since 1996, she has managed over 30 different food allergies within her family unit. In addition, two family members were diagnosed multiple times with Lyme disease. Being diagnosed herself with two tick-borne conditions, Lyme disease and alpha-gal syndrome, unfortunately gave Ms. Carrison a firsthand perspective on both tick-borne conditions and anaphylaxis. Since her diagnosis, she has passionately given her time to others in the alpha-gal community. In 2018, Ms. Carrison co-founded Tick-Borne Conditions United with Dr. Jennifer Platt, and in 2019, Ms. Carrison was appointed as a patient advocate to the Federal 2020 Alpha-Gal Syndrome Subcommittee, which served the Federal Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. Today, she will be discussing what TBC United is doing for advocacy, FDA labeling, how TBC United has been collaborating with FAIR and AlphaGal reporting at the state level. Next, Amanda Warren is an award-winning school nutrition director in Virginia. She has 25 years of hospitality, food management, and nutrition experience. She is a public speaker, vocal advocate for healthy school meals, food justice, and farm to school programming. Amanda holds a seat on the Virginia Department of Education Child Nutrition Ad Advisory Board, and she was diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome in December of 2021 and has since been publicly advocating on behalf of the alpha-gal syndrome community. In fact, she designed these really cute cards. I'm going to see if, it's, um, if they could be held up here. Maybe. Amanda will discuss them a little bit during her discussion. I really enjoyed the information cards that she designed uh, for disseminating alpha-gal information. Amanda will be discussing the complexity of diet and nutritional needs while navigating food safety concerns, assumptions in the food service sector, and diet in school settings. Heather Hargis is a practicing marriage and family therapist in Nashville and Franklin, Tennessee. Driven by her own diagnosis of alpha-gal syndrome, Heather became certified as a food allergy mental health coach and now runs an online alpha-gal support group for women. In her practice, she primarily sees young women ages 14 to 25, as well as working with individuals with alpha-gal and other food allergies. She will be discussing her experience with alpha-gal, hierarchy of needs, emergency kits and ways to overcome anxiety, community and belonging, and self-actualization. Last, but certainly not least, are Candice Mathis and Debbie Nichols. Candice and Debbie started blogging as two alpha gals after they were diagnosed with alpha gal syndrome in 2018 and 2019. Since then, They've been sharing tips and tricks on navigating life while living with the condition that they contracted from tick bites. With appearances in The Atlantic and on The Today Show, The Skim, Tick Boot Camp, and many other national and international podcasts and publications, Candace and Debbie continue to raise awareness of what it's like to live with alpha-gal syndrome without sacrificing joy. Candace and Debbie will be discussing tips and tricks of living with alpha-gal, finding resources, being your own advocate, and the importance of support. I'd like to take a brief moment to thank all of our panelists for being here today, offering their time and expertise on the important topic of alpha-gal. So let's begin our discussion with Dr. Tina Merritt. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to discuss alpha-gal syndrome and discuss the association with tick bites and also the clinical presentation, which could include urticaria, which is hives and anaphylaxis, which are generally thought to be normal food reactions. 
but there's also several other symptoms that are associated with alpha-gal. Well, it's not dancing, hang on. <laughs> There we go. History, um, in the 1980s, a doctor in Australia discussed a tick-related meat allergy. Mammalian meat allergy is what they called it. And then in 2004, M-Clone asked Dr. Platts Mills in Virginia to test for a severe allergic reaction to a cancer drug called Cetuxan. And um, we did a few tests and then it kind of fell to the wayside. And then in 2006, when I moved to Bentonville, Arkansas, there was a patient who died here from the cetuximab. So I called Dr. Platzels and asked him to develop the test. And um, we found that cetuximab contained a carbohydrate and the carbohydrate is called alpha-gal. And sensitization to alpha-gal is hypothesized to lead to an allergic response to beef pork, deer, milk, gelatin, and certain medication and product ingredients. The reactions seem to correlate with the distribution of the tick Amblyoma americanum, which is also called the Lone Star Tick in the United States. It's also associated with other tick species around the world. And then we're also finding um, other tick species in the United States that may be associated with the clinical presentation varies and symptoms range in severity. They can be mild and they can be life-threatening. This is a world map of self-reported alpha-gal allergy from 2002. You can see there's a large concentration in the United States, but it's also present in several other countries. This is one of the original articles by Dr. Platts Mills, Virginia. It was originally um, discovered to be related to the Lone Star Tick because of the distribution of the Lone Star Tick and this allergy in the Mid-South. And then they thought that it was related to the tick biting another mammal first, but we'll discuss that a little more. Um, it may not have bitten another mammal first before someone gets the alpha-gal allergy. And once the tick bite happens, this allergy can develop in one to three months. And then this reaction can be delayed. So that's the hard part with this allergy is it's not always associated with when someone ate and then broke out in hives or had anaphylaxis, but it's generally two steps. In the presence of alpha-gal and tick saliva, um, in 2001, Dr. Kareem um, and his group in Mississippi discovered that there was presence of alpha-gal in the saliva of the lone tick as well as the black leg tick, which is the one associated with transmitting Lyme disease. And the signs and symptoms of alpha-gal um, can be, like I mentioned, um, some people say two to six, some say two to 10, but the anaphylaxis, of course, is the most severe part of possible reaction, which could be deadly. Symptoms vary in the intermittent. So this is the general clinical presentation for um, food reactions, but alpha is a little bit unique in that it has severe abdominal pain associated with it. It can have a nausea and vomiting, heartburn, digestion, and diarrhea. It can have cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, and up in blood pressure, and some people dizziness and faintness. Urticaria is hives, and then some people get angioedema with swelling. Urologic symptoms, which this is fairly unique, I think, for alpha-gal, and I'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, there's a sense of impending doom with food allergic reactions, and sometimes this gets written off as anxiety. And then anaphylaxis can be present as a combination of several of these symptoms. And there was a survey done by the TBC United group, and the survey was posted on different internet websites and sent out to listserv um, emails. And over a three-year period, um, there were 2,122 people that responded. And I understand that the number is higher, like 2,500 people now. But at the time we did this um, presentation, there were over 50% of patients experienced the delayed reaction between four to six hours 
after exposure. 11% indicated reaction within five minutes and 40% had been to emergency room. 37% had seen or more reactions before they were diagnosed. And other unique features of this survey, um, there were unique symptoms reported. So some people talk about neurologic symptoms, emotional symptoms, and it's more than just part of the reaction. They were actually experiencing depression and anxiety as part of the reaction. Neurologic symptoms or even muscle spasms, and this is not normally considered. So a lot of doctors would probably look at those symptoms. And then several come to the frustration of having this allergy. And I think it's marvelous that there are so many support groups. Um, I think it's it's probably something unique to this food allergy. And, and I think it's great that there's a lot of support for this food allergy. And then some patients have fume reactions and cross-contamination reactions. And I think that is also discounted by the medical profession. Um, we don't think normally that a fume reaction could cause a reaction, but can. And then some patients are reactive to some of the binders and medications, such as magnesium stearate and glycerin, in addition to the gelatin. So it's not just capsules, it could also be the pills. Um, I was getting dizzy for six months before I realized my pill had pre-gelatinized starch in it. And then I've had this allergy since third grade, which is why I have a bit more insight. Um, there's also a need to educate providers about the diagnosis and, as well as patient education. But I know a lot of my patients are going out and educating other people. And the systems involved in the reaction, it's not just one system, but 88% of people reported skin symptoms, 63% respiratory, and 81% gastrointestinal symptoms. 40% had cardiovascular symptoms, and it's not um, just the lowered blood pressure. The patients actually got palpitations. Um, that's a rapid heartbeat that you can feel in your chest. And emotional symptoms, 35%. The nervous system, 30%. And then the motor system, so muscle spasms is a unique thing to this, I think, as well. Not everybody has that, but 22% reported that. And then this I borrowed from Jennifer Platt, so it has more technology attached to it. <laughs> but one of the other results from this survey was the other um, thing that can go with tick bites, obviously, is possible tick infections. And so when asked if patients had tick infections as well, 6 to 12% reported having Lyme. 6 to 8% reported having a rickettsia, which is like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Two to three percent reported other tick diseases like Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and Stari. And then um, at the bottom, it mentions some of the less common. There are some other forms of Borrelia, which is Lyme, and those are more newly described. And there were a couple of patients that reported those. And then one of the other results was what are the top five items that you react to? 96% reacted to beef, 86% reacted to pork. And then this is a newer number. The previous number we gave for dairy allergy was 55%. And now it appears to be up to 65% have reported having milk allergy as well. 58% um, gelatin and 43% personal care products. So lotions, soaps, things that you wouldn't think of, makeup, I had um, one patient that her husband would put a lip balm on at night and kiss her and she'd start coughing because there was lanolin in the lip balm. Patients I mentioned, and also vaccines are important. Um, some vaccines can contain animal ingredients and it's not all of them. There are safe influenza vaccines. Dr. Cummins um, has reported which ones he feels are safe. Um, but measles, mumps, rubella can contain mammal ingredients. Shingles vaccines, the newer one is supposed to be safer. And then the typhoid oral varicella vaccine contains mammal ingredients. Gelatin capsules, that one's fairly obvious, but um, you know, still have to think about this. When you're getting medication from your doctor, even if it's an antibiotic, you have to make sure that it's safe. And then medications and supplements can contain pre-gelatinized starch. 
Um, pancreatic enzymes, I did get one call about what is a safe pancreatic enzyme. And so I, I listed that here. Um, foods and medications contain steric acid, which is often animal derived. And then some commonly used medications include heparin, which is often from pork, simvastatin, it's for cholesterol, omeprazole if it's in a capsule, Synthroid, um, there are certain versions of it that are safe, but pharmacists have to check. And then the other byproducts that people can react to are lactose, gelatin, and steric acid. And so to check with your primary care or pharmacist, but a lot of times they're not aware of these ingredients. So we have to make sure that they are aware of them. And then other products that contain alpha-gal and not all patients react to these. I mentioned lanolin, um, it can come from sheep. And so I've had a patient, like I mentioned, that coughed just from contact with lanolin. Um, leather, that's not so common, but I've had patients that break out just from contact with leather. Pets and farm animals, that's a tough one. Uh, most patients will not give up their pets. <laughs> Um, but sometimes if they inhale animal dander, I think that causes some of the respiratory symptoms. I had a patient that when her dog would lick her, she would get hives. And in farm animals, I had a patient, she would brush her horse and she would start coughing up protein casts from her lungs from dander from the horse. And then things contain magnesium stearate. Um, so that's in other like Tic Tacs have magnesium stearate. Um, Altoid mints have gelatin. It's things you wouldn't think about contain mammal ingredients. And pet foods and treats, when they're from a mammal source, some people have trouble with those, um, handling those products or seeing those products. Um, ingredients such as lotions and soaps, detergents and deodorants can often contain mammal products. Um, usually if you can look up like vegan lotion online, you can find safe lotion. And then carrageenan, this is actually from red algae, so it's not a mammal ingredient, but it does contain an alpha-gal cytokine. And so some patients react to this. It's usually used as a thickener, um, like in the almond milk. You may want to make sure if you're having a reaction, it could be one of the additives like carrageenan. And in conclusion, there's thousands of people that are positive, i.e. to alpha-gal, that's the allergy antibody. And it appears to be 34,000 people were positive um, in 2018 on a publication from CDC. Um, we know it's higher, but that's what's been reported. And the symptoms include anaphylaxis, urticaria, angioedema, gastrointestinal symptoms, and chest symptoms. And the neurologic symptoms um, are also something fairly new. And then the things for the increase in alpha-gal allergy include it could be present in the saliva of the ticks. It could be related to the bacteria in the saliva of regional ticks, and it could also be increased tick exposure. And these are some resources, and um, I'll be sure and pro provide my slides with the resources on it. And this is my disclosure. I'm a part owner on the patent for the test for AlphaGal, and I sit on several nonprofit boards related to patients with AlphaGal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. And um, let me see. I am next uh, going to call on uh, Jan Zellner. Thank you, Mr. Zellner. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be discussing what are the knowns and unknowns of the epidemiology of alpha-gal. And we have to keep in mind that it's only been 15 years since this syndrome was identified and explained. And so our understanding is still pretty limited. Uh, epidemiological studies have been few and far between. So there's relatively little we can say for certain aspects. But what we do know, um, as Dr. Merritt has pointed out, this is a global phenomenon. 
and uh, it was it's been found caused by amblyoma and ixodid ticks all over the world on every continent except for Antarctica. There have been plenty of European cases, cases in Japan and Korea, South Africa, and even some cases in South America. Aside from those tick species, there's also the Asian longhorn tick, which has been implicated as the potential source uh, for alpha-gal in Japan and Korea, uh, which is a concern now because this tick is invasive in parts of the US and may be spreading. And we don't know yet if it's gonna cause alpha-gal here in the same way, uh, or if that has something to do with the ecological interactions of the tick in East Asia. As the history of alpha-gal was explained, um, it was kind of co-discovered at the same time in Australia and North America. There seemed to be this concentration of cases associated with two ticks uh, native to those areas. One, of course, is the Lone Star tick in North America, and there is the appropriate tick, the Ixodes holocyclus in Australia, that is the cause of all the Australian cases. Probably we don't really know how widespread it is in the world. Um, now the limitation is more who has access to the tests for alpha-gal. And so the wealthier countries, the United States, Europe, other developed nations are uh, have the technology and the funds to test for it more. So our true understanding of its global presence is limited by that. It may be more common in India or Africa than we know, um, but it'll be a while until those healthcare systems are caught up in testing for alpha-gal sensitization. So based on the data that we do have, it's pretty clear that the different tick species have different probabilities of inducing sensitization to alpha-gal. In North America, we focus on the Lone Star tick. That seems to be where most cases are. But if we look at the geographic distribution of those 34,000 positive tests that have been run since 2009, we do find other areas of the country with a substantial enough number of cases that can't just be explained by travel alone. So it's not people traveling to areas with the Lone Star tick and then coming back sensitized to alpha-gal, it's people reacting to local tick species. The lowest prevalence of alpha-gal sensitization is on the West Coast, so the Pacific Coast tick which can spread Lyme and other diseases, um, doesn't seem to be that commonly associated with alpha-gal. But in the Northeast, the numbers are higher. So the deer tick, uh, whose saliva in a different study mentioned by Dr. Merritt as well, has been shown to contain uh, alpha-gal, seems to have some probability of causing sensitization, even if it's lower than what has been occurring in the area of the Lone Star tick. And what we really don't know, of course, is, you know, are we detecting a proper geography or is this a function of uh, diagnostic patterns? So we went from zero cases of alpha-gal to 34,000. And this is largely a function of frequent diagnosis. We don't really have a good sense of alpha-gal increasing or decreasing in the population. Um, so we, made a, we might have had the same number of cases in 2009 as we do now, but since we've only been testing at an increasing rate in the last 15 years or so, 13 years, we don't know the underlying prevalence. Um, and intertwined with this is the issue of rising clinical awareness. So doctors are generally good about testing something they encounter more frequently. Um, so in those areas where the Lone Star tick is more common and alpha-gal awareness has been picking up, the testing is probably happening at a more frequent pace. 
than it is in other parts of the country where there may be a lower set of uh, alpha-gal cases or prevalence, but it may be underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed more often. We also don't really understand still the severity issue. And um, have we identified the most severe cases? Because those are the most likely to have, you know, seen doctors more frequently, shown up in urgent care settings, and been diagnosed uh, for this? Or, um, you know, do we have some other distribution pattern in the cases that we have identified? Uh, using repositories of uh, biosamples, there are estimates that 3% of the population is sensitive to alpha-gal, but what the clinical significance for this is pretty unclear, because there are people who test positive for the IgE antibodies, but don't present clinical symptoms. The other aspect, I guess, that we don't really understand is to what extent symptoms subside over time. We have anecdotal evidence that people become sensitized to alpha-gal, and as long as they don't have additional tick bites, over time that sensitization may decrease. But that may also vary by uh, individual genetics or other aspects of the sensitization. So we don't really understand um, what percentage of people you know, have declining severity and uh, what the rate of fate is in alpha-gal symptoms. That would be a very desirable epidemiological fact to learn besides the others. One study based out of Tennessee uh, at an allergy practice there reported that um, about 30% of the unexplained anaphylaxis cases that they faced before were the result of alpha-gal syndrome. So from a medical perspective, it's great that we've identified alpha-gal. We've made great progress. Um, you know, the, when they looked their cases back in 2006 before the identification of alpha-gal, and then a decade later, now they know that 30% of people showing up for anaphylaxis, idiopathic anaphylaxis, were really alpha-gal sufferers. Um, so that's a huge gain from the medical perspective. That's, of course, in an area where the Lone Star tick is dominant and the prevalence and incidence of alpha-gal is probably at its highest. Uh, we, again, don't know what the national picture might be. Um, there is an estimate uh, that alpha-gal may account for 10% of the cases of unexplained anaphylaxis nationwide, but it's not really based on you know, a deep data gathering exercise. So it would be great if we could get better epidemiological data on this over the next uh, decade or so. So these are all kinds of questions we would like to have answered. Um, you know, the true incidence, the trend line, the severity, um, people who have IgE uh, elevated levels without clinical presentation, um, and the rate of, say, unexplained anaphylaxis linked to alpha-gal. Um, all great questions and still unknowns. But I expect in the coming decade, we will have some of those answers, and they will certainly help improve diagnosis, case management, and generally broaden our understanding of alpha-gal. Thank you, Mr. Zellner. Um, I did mention in the beginning that we would wait for uh, the, the questions at the end, but we did have some questions come up. And before we uh, switch topics with our speakers, I would like to ask a couple of these questions for our panelists while um, we're right on the, on the topic. Um, we have um, a question by Paul, and I'm guessing this is for Dr. Merritt. What percentage of patients report numbness and or tingling of hands and feet? Um, that might be a better question for Dr. Platt. <laughs> so she's the one that did the data for the survey. Um, I know just in my experience in clinic, um, I would say it's a pretty small percentage, but I would say maybe 5% experience the tingling. 
And I found an association of that and the mast cells. So mast cells are allergy cells and they sit next to the neurons. And so I think if someone does have tingling, it might be related to their mast cells. So yeah, um, I would agree that it's a small amount and I haven't had a chance to go specifically look at the numbers since I saw um, Paul's question, but I was guessing in the uh, three to 5% range as well. Thank you, Dr. Platt. Thank you, Paul, for asking. Uh, we have a question um, by Elizabeth. Um, they ask, my alpha-gal figure was 71.8. What exactly does a figure this high mean? And in your opinion, how quickly could this come down with the possibility of remission? My allergist does not want to retest for two years. And this is for Dr. addressed to Dr. Merritt. So, um... The thing about alpha-gal is it doesn't fit the scale. So most food allergies have a scale of zero to six, six is the worst. And so like a peanut allergy of zero to six, six is the worst. You can say, well, six is anaphylaxis and you need to have strict avoidance. Um, alpha-gal doesn't always fit the scale, but if you do have a high number, you are more likely to have the severe reactions. And then I normally retest once per year and if you're not bitten, we used to say it could go away, quote unquote, in three to five years. And now Dr. Platts Mills and I both say it can go into remission because we both have it again. So if you get bitten again, your numbers can go up, but then also your sensitivity can go up. So I currently am negative, but I'm still symptomatic. And so that means that some other part of my immune system is reacting. It's not just based on the numbers. So you really have to listen to your own body and your own reactions. Okay, I have one more for Dr. Merritt now and then one for Jan before, um, before we move forward. And I do see a couple other questions that uh, will be addressed with the other speakers who are on those topics. So Dr. Merritt, would being autoimmune possibly trigger the high, a higher sensitivity? This was asked by Micah. Um, that is an observation that I've had is that patients with autoimmune disease tend to have a higher reactivity rate. So um, there's a nonspecific autoimmune test called an ANA, anti-nuclear antibody. I sometimes will check that if someone's having very high reactivity, even though their numbers don't look so bad. Great, thank you. And then I have another question by Micah, and I'm um, guessing that it is for uh, Mr. Zellner. It was in quotes um, saying increased tick exposure, meaning attract them more. And I believe it was uh, during your discussion, Mr. Zellner, about um, obviously the species, uh, the growing trend of the tick species and the exposure risk. Yeah, I think that's um, obviously just the incidence of tick bites and the greater number of interactions. We know the Lone Star tick has been expanding its habitat. Uh, we know they've been, you know, there's, there's this growing trend, but it's also hard to tell what is more diagnosis, you know, and more cases being caught versus more underlying, you know, people were getting bit before, we just had no idea, uh, you know, what the connection was. Um, so again, it's an area where it's a little gray knowing, are we getting more tick bites, uh, you know, more people getting bitten by ticks and there's this greater incidence throughout the country, uh, or in a particular region, or are we just, uh, diagnosing more cases in some places because we now know what it is and we have a test for it that allergists are particularly aware of uh in their regions that you know that have a high incidence to begin with great thank you everyone there are a few more questions in the q a we're going to move forward with the panelists and and revisit those questions in a bit thank you so much our next speaker um, is dr jennifer platt thank you so I suspect many of us have had the experience of being told our symptoms are quote unquote in our head. Um, 
in fact, Dr. Merritt, I would say, is probably one of the earliest alpha-gal patients to have been told this. She knows she's had it since 1979. And when she was in medical school in the early 90s, told her allergy professor that she reacted to red meats, and he told her that wasn't possible. So I want to spend the next few minutes giving you a snapshot of what has been happening in the arena of alpha-gal advocacy here in the United States. So earlier it was mentioned um, about the Arkansas Alpha-Gal Task Force and Dr. Merritt was on that. It just so happened that a legislator, Julie Mayberry, had Alpha-Gal. And so she set up this task force. They met for a year or two and they even went to Washington DC to meet with the FDA to advocate for increased awareness and labeling. At that point, they were told that they're really, uh, that they needed to document more about what was going on. So that's a background and I'm gonna share my screen now and I want to um, tell you about what has been happening in the last few years. So, um, you may be aware that um, the, um, there's the, the Federal Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, which was convened um, as a result of the 21st Century Cures Act back in 2016. They launched the working group in late 2017. So, I actually found out about this meeting the day before it happened. I wasn't able to go up to DC, but I was able to watch the two day meeting online. So for the full two days, most of the conversation at that point was about Lyme disease. And I will, the words are seared in my brain. Um, at the end of the second day, when they had set up all their subcommittees, um, the question was asked by one of the advocates on the working group, um, Pat Smith, she said to the chair, she said, what about this alpha gal? I hear it spreading like wildfire. And the co-chair said to her, we are going to table alpha gal because it's not a pathogen. And I, was very upset to say the least. When that happened, I got onto the Facebook groups and I had been on the Facebook groups for about a year before that um, because I don't personally have AlphaGal, but I live in a community where it's everywhere. Like you, everybody knows somebody who has AlphaGal syndrome here in Chatham County, North Carolina. Um, so I got on the Facebook groups. I said, we got to start advocating. And that was in, so that was in December. We actually submitted several applications for the subcommittee memberships. None of us got in. But what we did do after that was started putting our names in the hat for public comments. So at the beginning of every meeting, there is a 30 minute public comments that usually spit, pick 10 speakers. We got four people into that first uh, meeting after that December meeting. So in February, 2018, the four of us collaborated our comments. And you know, if you ever just are bored and wanna go surf YouTube, you can pull up all the tick-borne disease working group meetings and you can listen to the meetings. So we did a one, two, three, four coordinated attack, if you will, and they really didn't know what hit them. Uh, so from there, we were able to start getting more and more attention to alpha gal. That's really where we kind of threw down the gauntlet. And Beth and I founded TBCU that spring. 
And then we hosted the first international alpha gal symposium in May that year. And that is where we had uh, Dr. Cheryl Van Noonan from Australia, uh, Dr. Merritt was on there. So, you know, we had international experts in AlphaGal and that's on our website as well. I'll share that with you in a minute. But um, from there, in the first tick-borne disease working group report, which came out in 2018, AlphaGal was mentioned I think, uh, uh, 13 times. Then for the 2020 report, we were able to put uh, Dr. Scott Commons got onto the actual working group itself. And there was a subcommittee that produced a whole report on alpha-gal syndrome. And you can see here, Beth Carrison was on the membership of that subcommittee. In the 2020 report, alpha-gal got mentioned 64 times. And now I am on the next and final, the third and final round of the tick-borne disease working group. And I can tell you, every subcommittee has mentioned alpha-gal in their reports. Our final report is going to have considerable discussion of alpha-gal syndrome. So I just wanted you all to kind of get a foundation of how far we've come. We've actually been told by many in the Lyme community that we have accomplished in less than five years what has taken them two or three decades to accomplish. And Beth is gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So the my slides will, are not forwarding very well, <laughs> but... Um, so we have the website survey, and that was mentioned as um, earlier. And then I want to also just go through and um, share some information, some more information on our website, because that's really a gold mine. So you go to our website, which is tbcunited.org. We have a, under resources, we have a lot of different uh, videos you can watch. We've got the webcast. We've got, um, you know, COVID-19, AlphaGal webcast. Some of this information is a little bit outdated now, but this is really a good place to get a history of what has gone on in the AlphaGal arena that we've been doing it. TBC United. So we have brochures. Here's the first symposium. Um, you know, we've been cited in a lot of media. And let's see, here's another webinar that we did, Alpha-Gal Syndrome with FAIR. So that's a great set of resources. And then the other thing I wanted to direct you to is our blog. There's more information in here about things that we have accomplished as well and how AlphaGal is being tracked right now. Beth's going to talk a little bit more about that. And you can download the latest results from our patient experiences survey that Dr. Ter Merritt mentioned a few minutes ago. A biggie is that AlphaGal syndrome is now classified in the um, medical diagnosis uh, criteria so it can actually be coded and hopefully that'll help us to track it a little bit more. Um, some other things that we've accomplished and more that a biggie as well is our work with the Center for Lyme Action and funding the Hagen Tick Act. So before the Center for Lyme Action started advocating, I think the Lyme disease community was only getting about $34 million. And now because of the K. Hagen Tick, that, Tick Act, that has gone up to almost $150 million. So we've, we've come a long ways. There's a lot more to do. So... Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth and she can tell you about what is going on and uh, where we're going from here. 
Thank you, Beth. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, everybody, for um, you know, everything that's been brought forth so far in today's session. So, uh, you know, a lot of ground's been covered in a very short amount of time, as Jennifer had mentioned, and Dr. Merritt, um, Jan, and Adina. And it's really through partnerships. It's really all of us working together. We we're very strategic in our name, Tick-Born Conditions United. It was to pull everybody together. It's not just about alpha-gal, it's about all tick-born conditions and our right to have great healthcare and support and know how to protect ourselves from getting something like alpha-gal syndrome. So thank you to everybody um, uh, you know, here today that's helped contribute uh, to this, but also all the other great events that we've seen and participated in over the last few years. So through all of those connections, you know, Jennifer and I, we've been, you know, on and off a plane, not so much with COVID these days, but, you know, on and off a plane, on and off of webinars and doing presentations for, you know, um, uh, nurses associations and, you know, participation in the federal advisory committee. I feel like I need to take my glasses off because it's all glare, sorry. Um, and it's really, it takes all of us to work together. And so the history that Jennifer just went through, I want everybody watching this to give yourself a round of applause, pat on the back, because really the, the way we showed up was really helpful. You know, we provided a lot of great data and connected the dots. So I'm going to show you some of the results um, by sharing my screen. And oh, I have to put my glasses on. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, where did my share screen? Here we go. Let's see. Okay. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things that we need for alpha-gal syndrome, right? From labeling to tracking, like Don was talking about, and Jennifer, how, why that's so important. Um, you know, food labeling, whether it's foods or medical uh, product usage, things of that nature, it's been definitely challenging to get that um, underway. But we're very excited through connections, like with Adina. This is this was a surprise for Adina. We met. Uh, back, I think, physically met. We'd already spoken on the phone, I think, at that point. So I was so excited when you showed up. Uh, this was 2019, and we spoke at the Mid Coast Lyme Association, uh, Lyme Disease Association Conference, and, which was great. Dr. Kristen Honey spoke there, and she was one of the, um, the co chairs of the original Tick Borne Disease Working Group. But Please understand, this is this has not been easy for me as well. I'm not just co-founder of Tick-Borne Conditions United. I am a patient too. So this here, uh, the picture in the upper right-hand corner, you can see, you know, I'm kind of tilted at the white shirt. You can see I'm starting to react, and that was simply from people coming up to me, saying hello, and giving me a hug, and saying thank you for helping them online, or you know, I wanted to hear from you, or something like that, or um, Kristen Honey actually came up and said, I, I forgot I used stuff in my hair and I know this is the problem, so I can't hug you. And I said, okay, that's fine. But this is what happens. Every single conference, you know, Jennifer's out there trying to help um, make sure that I'm safe and <laughs> check the, the hotel lobbies and things like that, make sure it's not um, pork and air filled. But this was a really interesting conference. We stood up, we spoke. Um, I gave everybody a day in the life of what it's like to have alpha gal and it was a very eye-opening conference and from there we just continued to share um and grow i'm sorry i'm having a little bit of trouble here um but what was exciting so because a few hundred of us showed up right and we wrote in and we um some flew in to dc and spoke to the federal advisory committee we've gotten a lot of the things that we need and that we've been asking for, such as the ICD diagnostic code. Uh, we now have voluntary, voluntary alpha-gal tracking. I'm gonna go over that website real quick. Alpha-gal labeling has been requested. 
um, that would go through a lot of different organizations from beverage, products, medical, pharmaceutical. So this, it, we're in this for a long haul, right? Contacting our state and local legislators, showing up in DC, it truly is a united and coordinated effort. And so we're asking everybody to stay along with us because, uh, let's see, so sorry. I'm going to show you the CDC website. This was not here prior to that first slide Jennifer showed you where, uh, you know, a few of us showed up to the working group virtually and provided our um, verbal testimony. And so AlphaGal wasn't listed as even a, in connection with ticks. So it started out with a tiny little gray block, yay, that was good the first year. But then quickly it blossomed because they did start to really better understand what was going on with AlphaGal. So now we have the basics that our healthcare providers and others can go to. Um, there's even here for public health officials. This is where we're going to be asking for uh, support from the AlphaGal community to help write in to your local and state legislators to ask for their support in making AlphaGal syndrome something that they're going to track in their state. We're excited that New Jersey has already done that. Um, Jennifer is, uh, we're working at TBC United with um, Tennessee right now as well, but we really want to launch a strategic coordinated effort because that's what's working. So soon you'll see something from us where it will be just really kind of a click, click in point. You can do that now if you feel comfortable, you know how to contact, um, you know, your local pu public health folks or at the state level, you can go right here and uh, read up about it and share it. But we'll get that done so that we can work together as a team again, because we are one powerful alpha gal group, I have to say. Uh, now, so it, it gives them everything that they need um, at the state level. So now another thing that we're really excited, and we can't say a whole lot just yet, but food labeling. This is one that is so critically needed right now. TBC United has been a collaborator with Bayer since, so when did we do our video? It was 2019, I believe. Yeah, 2019. And uh, we did just, it was uh, Dr. Merritt and Dr. Platt and I, we just uh, did a, a AlphaGal syndrome video, uh, a webinar on the Bayer webpage. And from that and a lot of conversations over those years and participations in meetings with them, um, we have entered into agreement to work with them on this initiative. Now, they've done a great job with sesame labeling, right? Uh, but you'll see what's challenging um, on the CDC site. I'm still on the CDC site here. They do go into some basics about what might be of concern and, you know, foods clearly that are considered safe for somebody with an alpha gal. But we know that when you're really looking for help with alpha gal syndrome, the labeling's not there and the information isn't here on the FDA page yet for us. So we know there's work that needs to be done and we're working on that. Uh, but as Jennifer had pointed out on the Federal Advisory Committee, there's different um, organizations and entities that we're going to have to work with. So the, the fastest and greatest good is going to be on those packaged labelings. So look for something coming up um, inside. I can't say exactly when, but sometime within this next year, you will definitely see outreach from FAIR and TBC United. And we're going to be leaning on the Alpha Gal Syndrome community to please rally around this uh, so that we can get the, the labeling moved through really quickly. Um, who would you want to get involved? You know, every, anybody, anybody that's a stakeholder, your whole family may have changed their whole life, right? We can't cook in the house sometimes. Um, you know, the products in the bathrooms have to change. And so therefore your whole family has to change. They're a stakeholder too. So wouldn't your, uh, your healthcare provider, um, any 
you know, anyone that's um, supporting you in your care would be a great person to ask to support this as well. So, so those are the next steps, right? So we've got we've got a diagnostic code, we've got voluntary tracking, we've um, gotten um, agreement on the federal level that yes, alpha gal needs some attention with labeling and that's formally going before Congress at the end of the year. So stay tuned for more. Um, and in relation to more advocacy, what's not noted on my slide, uh, please write into the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, share your lived experience because that's where we're really seeing the momentum right now. Um, and although they've their full support and they're fine tuning that report that's gonna to go to Congress, it's still gonna anchor in how much of a need there really is out here. So I encourage you to you know, um, take a look at some of the older posts and the blogs. You can go on to the Google Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. You can look at the old meeting dates and uh, look at different written and verbal commentaries. You can listen or read them to see what others have done uh, and just help help with this initiative. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. We're really excited to get to work on um, the food labeling and really get going on the tracking because that is going to really help drive the support, the funding, and everything that we need. Um, yeah, as I said, and I'm saying it again, it really takes a village. I mean, all the work that we've done would not have been possible without the connections of Lyme to TV and Center for Lyme Action and LymeDisease.org and uh, Midcoast Lyme and you know all the different organizations that we've worked with. It, they have really uplifted the Alpha Gal support or the Alpha Gal community by really rallying around us as a community, knowing what it's like to be suffering out there without that support and not knowing what direction to go into. So um, thank you to everybody that's ever given anyone with alpha gal or any tick-borne condition a helping hand. It's really important that we continue to keep working together. And uh, with that, I will pass it back to Adina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, we do have some more questions addressed to um, Beth and Dr. Platt, um, and we will circle back uh, at the end with them, but uh, they are excellent questions. Thank you, everyone, for asking them. Our next speaker is Amanda Warren. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks, Adina, and uh, thanks for all these great updates that I've been hearing. I'm super happy to hear about the food labeling moving forward, as that is a passion of mine. Um, I'm happy to be here today. Um, as Adina pointed out in the uh, bio, I was diagnosed back in December 2021. Um, so just a little over um, eight months that I've been diagnosed. It was obviously a, a very disappointing diagnosis, but um, I figured with my culinary background and my nutrition background, plus that I had direct experience planning other people's allergy accommodations, that I would be set up for success. Um, but as many of us know with alpha-gal, the complexities soon become, you know, very apparent. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's reasonable that most of us, uh, I think, you know, upon diagnosis, we our first question is, what do we eat? Because, um, you know, we want to fulfill that basic need of food. Um, and so it makes sense, you know, you start to dive into what that diet looks like and you find that poultry, seafood, grains, fruits, veggies, all of that, you know, is going to work. And it sounds easy enough but then you're still becoming ill. Um, and so cue that you start peeling back these layers and you find out, oh, there's mammal byproducts and carrageenan in certain chicken brands that they use for plumping. Aquaculture mammal feed is used for farm raised, you know, seafood facilities. We find that carrageenan again, which was addressed earlier by Dr. Merritt um, is found in a lot of our safe vegan foods or milk alternatives. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's problematic with, uh, for some people in the, in the AG community, it makes them very ill. Uh, the terms like all natural that hide problematic ingredients, even, even some, you know, misleading food industry promotion like pork, you know, as the other white meat or the latest trend in plant powered and plant-based foods that are still containing dairy and whey, but aren't, you know, front facing labels. 
Um, they all put the alpha gal community at risk and it perpetuates what I think is um, really a pretty egregious, you know, food access gap and, and gap in food insecurity for this particular population of people. Um, in my profession, I'm typically looking at food justice is issues, you know, through the lens of low income at risk families. But really, we have a, a, a whole unique community of people here experiencing a health crisis that coupled with these food system failures creates barriers to food access and to food and nutrition security. Um, and it's, you know, it's really concerning. I did a couple polls recently on my Alpha Gal Now um, Facebook support group. And um, in a poll of 718 responders where I was asking about food access, 21% said it was difficult to find the foods that they needed. 18% um, said they found the foods that they needed to be unaffordable. And 13% were having trouble maintaining nutritional needs even though access wasn't an issue. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a large chunk of people um, not beating, you know, not meeting their basic needs. And it's, and it's really unfortunate and it really needs to be addressed. Um, and then in another poll where I kind of talked about behaviors, um, those social and emotional behaviors around eating and uh, around um, eating in groups or in, in um, you know, group settings, uh, I had 590 responders. 18% of this group said that they'd been made sick as a result of eating out. Um, trying to, you know, trying to explain and get their allergy accommodated. 20% had fear around not being in control of their food. For instance, if they were to be hospitalized or to travel. Um, and then 19% that said they felt isolation as a result of non-inclusive planning around food related events. Um, and that's, you know, that's sad um, because that again, perpetuates the anxiety and the depression and some of the other social and emotional and mental, you know, issues that arise out of a specific physical health crisis. And I think there's also, you know, other, other things that, that are at, at play here. There's lots of stuff. We're dealing with food deserts. Um, these, these deserts exist in urban and rural areas, but it's basically not being able to get to, you know, a grocery store um, that might have the necessary foods to accommodate um, or stay in compliance with this allergy. Um, obviously affordability. Um, most often we're leaning towards finding foods that are organic or higher priced um, because there's no animal byproducts you know, labeling and, and these sort of specialty labels in and of itself create you know, um, a more expensive kind of version of, of these foods. Um, there's barriers to, um, you know, access to tools and the skills around food preparation. Not everybody knows how to whip up a quick scratch cooked whole foods meal. Um, so many people lean toward, um, you know, packaged and prepared foods um, like many of, you know, the vegan um, cheeses and the vegan pizzas and things like that, which people are finding they're reacting to because of, um, you know, base ingredients like carrageenan and, and, and things like that. And it's, um, again, it's concerning time. Um, this allergy takes lots of time. Time reading food labels, um, time researching because um, you're often sent out of your allergist office with little to no care plan. Um, they just tell you that you have this allergy. Um, then there's continued illness. Uh, which I think oftentimes um, is perpetuated by this food access and this food insecurity issue because we can't get our body systems healthy. If our gut biomes and our digestive tract is all messed up, we can't absorb the nutrients that we need. Even if we're eating the whole foods, some people aren't able to eat as much because their appetite decreases. Um, and so they start supplementing with vitamins. Well, vitamins aren't going to really help your body that much if your gut biome is inflamed, if your digest digestive tract is a mess. Um, and so it just keeps this cycle of illness going. Um, again, anxiety, depression that's been um, addressed, lack of social support, an uninformed care system. Um, it really is, it, it's a full crisis of care um, around this whole community. And, um, I hope that more advocacy work focuses on that as well. 
and um, on, you know, providing people with nutrition counseling and nutritionists. I know there are some, some insurance companies that when you are diagnosed with a food allergy will, will help cover the cost of nutritionist or, or, or seeing a dietitian. And I think that that's an important, um, you know, note that allergists or physicians who are diagnosing this, you know, with patients need to refer them um, and let them know that there's going to, you know, there's going to be a big change around your food and you might need some help with it. Um, and I haven't even addressed school age children that have AG and are trying to depend on school meals um, due to income restraints. And it, it's a, it's a very real thing. There are families in need. There are kids who solely rely on school meals. Um, and I did have an opportunity to um, speak publicly, to make public comment at the Tickborn Working a group that um, Beth had referred to earlier. I did that in January, and and it did address you know the the issue of alpha gal um, allergy accommodations in school and the complexities of trying to meet the USDA meal pattern while still um, keeping a child's meal and their food safe. And it is complex, um, and I I just hope that you know as this information opens up widely and more broader to the public. Um, we want people to know about this, but we really want people to have a, a more deep understanding of it before they uh, move to, you know, make allergy accommodations. Um, schools and restaurants, um, I think sometimes they might be making people sick because they are making base level assumptions about the allergy, you know, kind of like, well, just feed them chicken, they'll be fine. But that lacks a deep understanding of, of the whole, you know, the whole syndrome, the, the complexity of all the food and um, how to most safely accommodate that allergy. Cross contact needs to be, you know, um, key when, when thinking about food safe space and how to um, safely accommodate um, this allergy, but also, you know, the very base ingredients. Um, I had an experience once at a conference where, um, one of the um, vendors was advertising his um, tortilla shell as vegan. And I specifically asked if he was vegan certified and he said he was not vegan certified. And so I read the ingredients on the label and um, there was sugar and it was um, you know, not named organic. Um, it was just a base sugar. So I asked him if he knew where the sugar came from and he did not. Um, and so I explained to him about alpha gal uh, um, and you know the the correlation between bone char and sugar and how some people can become sick from that. And so he did go back to his manufacturing uh, company and found, found did find an answer and directly emailed me back and apologized, um, saying that it actually wasn't um, a vegan sugar in the in the product. And um, so the the good news is they're not going to, you know, they're not going to advertise it that way anymore. But the bad news is, is we know that that's happening frequently um, across the country and in food manufacturing, you know, um, systems, because they don't understand the, the deep molecular sort of components of this allergy. Um, so recently, the uh, Child Reauthorization Act was moved through the Senate, and the Child Reauthorization Act covers healthy school meals um, and um, uh, covers other programs like SNAP and, and benefits that help children with food access. But I think something that's important to talk about with child reauthorization this year is that in it is specific language around um, scratch cooking in schools and plant-based meals in schools. Um, the connection between those two is that Scratch cooking in schools helps school systems mitigate for food allergies. If you are controlling the ingredients, you know, the, from the very basic um, start of them, and you're controlling the environment, and you're controlling, uh, you know, for foodborne, um, I'm sorry, for uh, cross contact, then, then you're going to keep that child safer. Um, but oftentimes, you know, schools don't have the equipment or they don't have the, um, you know, the labor to do scratch cook programs. But I do think that um, it's important 
that we encourage school systems to move in this direction or to at least um, consider, you know, scratch cooking in batch for children with food allergies specifically. Um, and then plant-based meals, I think, again, that, you know, they just sort of lend themselves to, to being able to safely manage meals um, around alpha-gal allergy. It's, so, it's just a way to um, naturally suit this in a school setting. <clears throat> and then um, I'm referring to some notes here, so I apologize. Uh, I would encourage um, you all to, you know, ask your, like very much like Beth and, and, and Jennifer discussed, um, this advocacy work is so important. Um, and so to ask your representatives to support child reauthorization, if you think that is a good fit for your school systems, um, to, you know, use your voice to ask for support of other important issues, um, like, you know, transparent food labeling and, um, you know, tick tracking because it is voluntary at this point. So we really need to be speaking at our state levels and encouraging our states to, to do what's right for their communities. Um, and then just to close out, I think it's important to, to add what worked for me um, and what helped me sort of move back to a state of health. And I do believe that uh, a whole foods diet is the best way in the beginning to sort of get your body system um, back in shape. Um, you know, reducing some inflammation and reducing um, all the messiness that's going on in your gut biome. So focusing on those, those whole food products, um, those, the fruits and the vegetables and the whole grains and making sure that you're adding prebiotic foods, um, not necessarily a supplement, but actual, you know, prebiotic foods to help kind of fix that gut biome so that you can start, um, Again, absorbing the right nutrients and, and making sure that um, you're you know you're getting all the nutrition that you need from the from the diet that you're you know you're that's currently working the best for you. Um, you know things like vitamin C and um, um, uh, proteins, iron, things like that really need to come from your food um, rather than from supplements because again it's that absorption thing. And so what worked for me was because I didn't have much of an appetite in the beginning, um, was to eat smaller meals throughout the day so I could keep my calories, um, you know, in check and to also kind of focus on, um, I would call them the more bland foods. So I made a lot of pilaf with, um, you know, some whole grains added in, um, hemp seeds, things along that nature. And, um, and anyway, just, you know, just sort of focusing on, on, on a whole foods approach. Um, I hope you found this helpful. I just realized in the corner that I went over a little bit. I apologize, panel. I'm going to move on to the next um, um, attendees. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and we do have some questions directed uh, towards you um, and also uh, to Beth and Jennifer. But again, thank you for all the wonderful questions. Uh, we're going to uh, work through our next two speakers and then we'll address them all at the end. Um, some of them also address, um, you know, children at home as well as what you discussed. All right. So Heather Hargis, thank you so much. You are up next. Hi, everyone. Um, I, as uh, Adina said, I'm a therapist here in Nashville, Tennessee, and was diagnosed in 2019. With alpha-gal, the interesting piece is I had my first reaction in about October of 2018, but I had enough people that I did know with alpha-gal that my experience was so different that I didn't get tested, and it turned out to be positive, um, and I kind of dove in as deeply as I could, joined all the Facebook groups, were listening to all the different um, conversations that were happening, and so as a therapist, I found myself really drawn to people's emotional experience with AlphaGal. And um, I'm going to kind of go through uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how that affects individuals with AlphaGal specifically um, as alongside mental health. And a few tips on how to manage that. I think um, Candace and Debbie will go a little more into depth in some of those management skills. But um, one of the things I realized is um, when I was reading these different quotes from people, I'm going to read one quote that I kind of pieced together. So don't worry if you're on those groups. I don't think I'm quoting anyone directly here. 
Um, but this kind of encapsulated what I was reading. Every time I have a reaction, I have to deal with a lot of anxiety and emotions, not to mention just feeling alone, abandoned, worthless, a burden. I mean, the list goes on. And so many people were saying that same thing. So that is when um, I decided that I felt like there had to be some sort of certification for working with people who were experiencing food allergies. So I got my certification as a food allergy coach, which allows me actually to work across state lines um, in that capacity. So I'll talk a little bit more about this, but I have a, um, an online uh, kind of support process group that meets once a month with some plans and some other therapists that I've met with AlphaGal to start some more of those. Um, so I can give my information to Adina if anybody's interested in learning more about that. But Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you guys are familiar with that in any sense, a lot of us probably heard a little bit about it like in seventh grade or something like that. But the very first need, sort of like Amanda was talking about, that we need to have met in our lives so that we can move kind of up this ladder is our physiological or physical needs. Um, and you know, AlphaGal hits almost every one of those. One, the first is food. We have to have food to survive and to live. And AlphaGal makes that difficult. Um, secondly, um, breathing. If you, if you experience anaphylaxis with AlphaGal, your breathing might be in question. Um, since AlphaGal usually, as I understand it um, in my experience, uh, the reactions are what, three to eight hours later. A lot of times you wake up in the middle of the night, that affects your sleep, not to mention the anxiety, which can also affect sleep. So that first level of what you need um, to function just as a human is called into question. The second um, in the list of his needs or that he identified is safety and security. Um, so that also hits in a bunch of different areas being safe going to the hospital. If you are fume reactive, can you stay in a hospital room that's near the cafeteria? And that, on top of that, can you eat cafeteria food? Are people going to understand when you ask for accommodations? Then that leads to a hospital where most people would feel most safe suddenly isn't quite as safe um, for people with alpha gal anymore. If you, um, safety and security includes employment. If you work in the food industry, or if you work next to the kitchen, or maybe even not next to the community kitchen at your um, employ a place of employment, that could make your um, what you need to survive and live off on live on um, then potentially unavailable or very difficult to maintain a job, which ends up being part of your security um, and your family, which leads into the love and belonging, which is the next um, rung on the on the ladder. But um, if your family, if you're a parent of someone, a child with AlphaGal, that is um, the security of knowing that your child's gonna be okay is also um, difficult to manage. The next is moving up to love and belonging. And um, I think Amanda talked about this too, with our culture is so centered around food. That's what we do when we get together. Let's go meet for happy hour, let's go, um, have dinner at your birthday, we want to take you out. It can lead to a lot of loneliness. Um, a lot of people find themselves dealing with um, depression. Even if you're looking at having a pet, which would be um, something that can also uh, give you the sense of love and belonging, sometimes that isn't possible for someone with AlphaGal. So um, all of those pieces can lead to loneliness, can lead to depression. Another uh, topic for love and belonging is family. Can you go to the family gathering for Christmas? Can you eat the food that you would like to eat on Easter with your um, siblings? A lot of those things that we consider com comforting um, are not something that is safe for someone with AlphaGal, potentially without a high level of vigilance. The next is self-esteem. So that would be you know, having confidence in yourself, <clears throat> having the respect of others. If your family and your friends or your medical professionals tell you that this is all in your head, you're making this up, 
um, it doesn't happen to you every time. So how would you know that you actually have alpha-gal? It's not even really a thing. Um, that can attack your self-esteem, which is something that you're looking for um, as you move up the hierarchy of needs. Another piece of that that has been touched on a little bit when we were talking about um, different uh, products and toiletries you would use, but you may lose a lot of weight when you're self-conscious. Some people have gained weight. Um, in one of the Facebook groups, people talk about losing their hair. So there's a lots of things that could attack your self-esteem, which would also lead to loneliness because you probably don't want to go out in public or um, spend time with people when you're not feeling the best about yourself. But moving through all those, um, as you conquer those different things, you'd move to self-actualization. So I'm going to go back down to the um, bottom of the physiological needs. A lot of that um, comes down to finding ways to maintain a high level of self-care, um, a way to work through the safety and security is to find your medical team, spend the time investing in finding the people that believe you, the people that you trust, a doctor who says, well, let me see if I can help you or a pharmacist, find the medication that, um, that will be safe for you. Not a doctor that says, well, I'm going to tell you, you need vitamin D. You go figure out how to do that, which has happened to me. Um, also self-regulation and learning how to um, manage some of that anxiety. A lot of times a reaction feels like anxiety and anxiety feels like a reaction. So knowing your body, I know generally what my body does when it's reacting to something. So I can talk myself down. I can regulate myself because I'm familiar enough with my body and what my um, alpha-gal symptoms look like. Um, love and belonging. Um, that's part of what our support group is. We may not see each other face to face, but we get together once a month and we may have a topic we talk about. We may get together and just share the frustration of I had to cancel this camping trip because I'm afraid of getting another tick bite and feeling the sadness and the grief because grief is a big part of this and um, honoring that grief in the process. Um, so as you move through these things, self-esteem would be learning um, advocacy, self-advocacy for yourself, being able to stand up and say what you need. And a lot of times that's making a choice. If I don't feel checking in with myself, if I don't feel strong enough to go to a party where I'm not going to be able to eat anything, I don't go. But two days later, I might feel like, yeah, I can handle that today. So I'm going to, to go to that. But the goal is kind of what I'm seeing this panel do here today with the self-actualization. The way I see that is becoming an advocate, becoming someone who can reach behind and help the people coming along who have just been diagnosed to be able to say, yeah, you, you can do that. For me, that's running um, the support groups. For someone else, it may be posting recipes that um, are similar to um, you know, what you may have been able to eat at a restaurant before. Or some people who travel, um, I know I talked to Candace one time when I was traveling and she gave me tips for traveling. Um, so I'm going to kind of wrap up now so uh, Candace and Debbie can um, talk more about kind of how they manage the day-to-day -day of this. But if you guys, if anyone's interested in learning more about the support groups, um, right now there's only one, but I'm looking at doing more. So I'll give my information to Adina, but very honored to be here. and. Happy to answer any questions. That's all very important information. Uh, patients, you know, need all the self-care and support, right? And last but not least, we have Candace and Debbie from Two Alpha Gals. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis, and we're two alpha gals. And we are super honored to be here today. Um, and we're excited to share some of the things that we have learned on our personal journeys with alpha gal syndrome. And what a journey it has been. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you share the sentiment given that the average time a patient lives with alpha-gal syndrome without diagnosis is over seven years. And we were no exception to that. We've been living with alpha-gal syndrome for a collective 25 or 30 years. So now that you know why we're here, we want to share some of the things that we've learned together about living with alpha-gal syndrome. Right. 
Right. So I had my first anaphylactic reaction a few months after um, I was diagnosed. It was late 2019. My family was on a cruise vacation and I was exposed to something. And when I went down to tell the medical staff that I had had an allergic <laughs> reaction to mammal that I hadn't consumed, they didn't believe me. And so after years of being dismissed by medical staff, I just absolutely had enough. And so as soon as I got in cell phone range uh, at the port, I called Candace and we decided that we had to do something about the lack of information and the lack of awareness. And that's when we started digging and we searched for information and discovered that there was limited information out there. So we started blogging and writing about our own experiences. And we started reaching out to some of the lead researchers and making connections in the industry so that we could try to help other people living with this, shorten the distance between onset of symptoms and their diagnosis. And additionally, we want to help others shorten the distance between diagnosis and joy. So we choose not to accept this diagnosis as a death sentence. Yes, there will be a mourning period and it's okay to grieve the things that you lose. Like for me, it's bacon and cheese, but we choose not to stay there. <clears throat> we, we're actually choosing joy. Um, but before you can even think about joy, you really have to think about living living with alpha-gal syndrome. And I emphasize living because the first thing you have to do to figure out is how you're going to survive. So I know many of you who are listening today are probably past this stage, but I want to speak for a moment to the people out there who aren't, who are overwhelmed trying to figure this out. You are not alone. And we want to help you. Everyone on this panel wants to help you. And we want to help you help yourself. That's right. And as Debbie said, the first thing that you need to figure out is how you're going to survive alpha-gal syndrome. So the first step is to figure out your level of reactivity. And if you haven't already figured that out, you what you can and cannot put in and on and around <laughs> your body, um, a really great tool to use is to journal, to use a food journal. Um, one of Several of my specialists actually asked for a food journal, be it my immunologist, all the way to an ENT. So once you've figured out the foods and products that you need to stay away from, it's much easier to get into a routine. Right. Exactly. So for me, it was critical that I knew that there was always going to be something on hand for me to eat at any meal time or at snack time. Um, I needed to know that I wasn't going to go hungry, right? That was the scariest thing. So for example, I knew I couldn't have, I, I could have eggs for breakfast. So I always made sure I had eggs on hand, which for me is particularly easy because I have seven chickens. <laughs> so, um, but having my home life under control didn't make the idea of going outside of the house any less daunting. So you have to consider what a safe life looks outside of the house, what it looks like outside of the house. And this means considering all new things, right? It means getting educated on products and sourcing. It means doing your homework. It means making sure that others around you know about your condition. And that could be a close friend, you know, or a spouse, but it could also mean wearing a medical ID bracelet if you find time that you have a lot of time on your own. And it means building the confidence to tell other people what it is that you need. That's right. So what steps are you going to take to be safe when you leave your home? What does going to a restaurant look like? So for me, it always means calling ahead. And sometimes it means bringing my own salad dressing or my own meal or even skipping out on certain restaurants. If some of my friends are going to a steakhouse, I know I can't be around that because I'm theme reactive. So I'll meet up with them afterwards. So going out suddenly requires a whole lot more preparation than it used to. But survival isn't about so is about so much more than just the day to day. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what we do to prepare. So number one, know your body metrics. Determine what a reaction looks like for you so that you aren't caught by surprise when one hits. Learn to differentiate between a reaction and anxiety because they look very similar. <laughs> Two, get a plan in place. Know the steps you are going to take to manage a reaction. Three, bring your toolkit always, <laughs> everywhere you go. We know this condition looks completely different from person to person. So figure out what your toolkit kit needs to have in it, even if it need, means talking to your medical professional. Um, my biggest sign of a reaction is I get really low blood pressure. 
So I always have a blood pressure cuff with me at all times. And it helps me to determine if I'm actually having a reaction. Um, and if I do, I will start with Zyrtec, my pre prescription Pepsid, um, and possibly move on to Unisom sleep melts. Um, I always, always have two EpiPens with me at all times in case it goes to that as well. Um, and this one, number four, is a biggie. Mm -hmm. Establish a support system. This could start with a friend or spouse or neighbor. Share your plan, plan with them so that they know what to do and how to help you if a reaction hits. Um, Debbie and I call each other our first responders. Um, there have been many, many times where I have called Debbie just to walk through what I'm feeling in my body. And oftentimes that's all I need to kind of lower my anxiety and manage what's happening. That's right. That's right. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about the fun stuff. So once you know that you're ready for when a reaction hits, you can start thinking about the ways that you're going to reinvent your life. Um, something that was a little hard for me to uh, come to terms with at the beginning of this whole thing was realizing that my life may never look exactly like it did before. I may never eat bacon or cheese. <laughs> so what am I going to do about it? I did grieve for a bit, I still occasionally do, but then I discover these areas of life that I had never explored. For example, and this is a little later in our journey, but Candace went plant-based about a year ago. Now, I never thought I would say this, but I would choose some of her vegan recipes over the mammal stuff I used to eat because it's just that good. And now I still eat poultry and seafood because that's what I've determined my body needs, but I feel like I've had this whole window of opportunity open to me. And we all know that food allergies are all about sacrifice, but I realized that giving those things up, those things that I have to give up to be safe, to go plant-based or even fins and feathers based, it doesn't have to mean sacrificing flavor. It means exploring new ways to enjoy it. Do I still love a pulled barbecue sandwich? I do, but it has to be chicken now instead of pork or beef. And it has to be on a safe bun. That's another thing I have to check now. But you know what else I love? jackfruit barbecue, completely <laughs> vegan. And I never thought I would try it again, but I never thought I would try it, but she's got me eating it again and again. <laughs> so this is, this is a really great opportunity and don't miss this chance to try something new that she might discover you love. That's right. And find ways to take the things that you love that might not be safe and modify them. This doesn't just apply to food. This applies to celebrations and holidays and get togethers. Um, actually, one of our favorite memories of doing this was Easter 2020. Debbie and I and our family celebrated with a non Alpha Gal family, and we made the most beautiful Alpha Safe Middle Eastern feast, which was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. It, it really was. And one of the most common things we hear from our followers, in addition to that, is that they're scared to go outside. Don't sacrifice the things you love that you can make safe. Just find safe ways to enjoy them. I still spend a stupid amount of time in my barn with my animals and I see ticks all the time, but I wear protective gear and I wear really strong repellent and I'm diligent about doing tick checks. So we say oftentimes don't live in fear, live aware. Do the things you love, but incorporate ways to do them safely. And this gets a lot easier as you go. Resilience is the ability to bounce back and recover. It's knowing that there's always a chance of reaction, but I'm going to do everything I can to live a joyful life safely. And as Debbie mentioned, um, recognize that there's a chance your life will never go back to the way it was, but open your eyes to the amazing new opportunities in front of you. And when you step into those opportunities with an open mind, know that you are prepared for the curveballs that may come your way. If you're prepared and know your body and the steps you're going to take before you go into a reaction, you will reduce the stress of having to make a difficult decision in a very stressful moment. Yes. And we are still going to have setbacks. Candace and I, we're still in the thick of all this, figuring it out, but it gets easier and recovery from those setbacks gets quicker. Know that joy on the other side of this stress is actually attainable. And we found joy in so many new things like recipes or traditions, all the stuff we've mentioned. But don't forget the things that can't cause a reaction that bring you joy, like for us, music or hiking or being outside or other hobbies. So find those things that bring you joy and latch onto them. 
for me personally, it's all the dairy-free ice cream because they now make a chocolate salted caramel oat milk ice cream that is so good. <laughs> Double check that does not have carrageenan. That's right. Oatly is amazing. Um, <laughs> and for me, I love finding new vegan restaurants. Mm -hmm. They've become some of my favorites. So we also just kind of want to reiterate what Heather spoke on. We are huge mental health proponents, and that is a huge huge founda foundational piece to this. So don't overlook your mental health and be open to trying new things like tapping or EMDR therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to sum it up, we're trying to go fast through this. We have so <laughs> many things to tell you. Be prepared, <laughs> find support and be support. Know where you can find accurate information because you certainly cannot believe everything you read on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And educate yourself and be an advocate for AlphaGal because the louder our voices together, the more people will hear us. Yes. And take care of your body and mind. Caring for your mental health is more than just self-care. It's about self-compassion. So this is not always an easy road, but find validation and be vigilant because, because ticks suck, but life doesn't have to. And we are grateful for all the panelists here, for all of the hard work everyone's done. And um, if anyone wants to find more about uh, two alpha gals and tips and tricks that we have for living a joyful life, you can visit us at two alpha gals. That's T-W-O alpha gals.com. And thank you guys for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And of uh, of course, everybody's discussion was highly important, but one of the largest takeaways that I just heard was that ticks suck, right? <laughs> and um, and of course, we should do as much as we can every single day to protect ourselves from tick bites because ticks are extremely dangerous and spread a plethora of diseases and pathogens. So we have a number of questions here that are all excellent. And I'm kind of going to go a little bit uh, down the list in order be since they are a little bit correlated to the speakers and the time of, um, of as we pass through our panel. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, Candice did uh, mention that um, themselves and both of their uh, two little kids, five and seven, and their mom also are positive for alpha gal and um, uh, they're just not understanding how, you know, that they all have alpha gal syndrome. It's, it's kind of, um, a hard hit to your family, Candace. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I know you have some further questions down the line and we'll get there, but I did want to acknowledge your comment and I'm sorry to hear about your family. All right. So Courtney asks, and, um, can you explain the process that causes some people to keep alpha gal rather than go into remission? Uh, say if there are no more tick bites, what will cause people uh, to keep it forever, have um, alpha gal for many years? And I and I'm going to address that first to Dr. Merritt. Well, I've had this since the third grade, and um, so that's about 40 years now. I think it has to do with memory cells. So your immune system actually has memory. And so my immune system must have a pretty good memory. But I have had some tick bites, you know, over the years. Um, when I was 15, I went unconscious and didn't realize it was from an egg McMuffin. And when I was 18, I got diagnosed with a class four beef and pork allergy. And back then we didn't know what alpha gal was, but class four is fairly high. And it explained a lot of my symptoms and I cut it out until 2008 when Dr. Platts Mills told me I was negative. And so I chewed a piece of steak and spit it out and thought, well, because I didn't ingest it, I'll be fine. And I woke up six hours later with severe abdominal pain and I tried to get up and walk to the bedroom and I passed out. And so that was with a negative test, I've passed out. So it must be some other mechanism in the immune system. And I think we're just touching on that. Um, there's a Dr. Iwila at UNC who published, I believe last year, the mechanism for how people develop IgE to alpha-gal, but we haven't really touched yet on how people maintain this sensitivity. And I think um, as time goes on, we'll learn more about it, but everybody's different. Everybody's immune system is different. Um, mine likes to have a good memory. And so I can't have beef or pork ever again. Um, 
Let me see. Our next question would be, do you have any theories as to why some people test negative to the um, blood and or skin test? And I know you mentioned a little bit about that, but um, maybe um, you or uh, Mr. Zellener may have uh, some further insights as to um, why different patients may um, may test negative. Um, IgE is just one mechanism for allergic reactions. In the textbooks, there's something called Jill and Coombs classification of allergy, where there's four mechanisms for allergic reactions. So most allergists only test the one, IgE, but there are other mechanisms. And so if you have symptoms that are clearly related to alpha-gal, then I would listen to your body and, and avoid those things. for the answer and thank you for the question, Sarah. Um, Karen asked, maybe, um, you know, at the point in time, we'll cover this later, but they're curious about Zolaire as a treatment for alpha-gal syndrome. Um, Zolaire binds up IgE. So IgE is your allergy antibody. So regardless of your reason for IgE binding to the mast cell, we think Zolaire might block that trigger, whatever it is. Um, Zoller is produced in an animal cell line, but it's not alpha-gal. And so it does have some carbohydrate on it, but I do have a couple of patients that I think have had reactions not related to alpha-gal to Zoller, but they are doing clinical trials with different food allergies, um, multiple food allergies using Zoller to bind up the IgE allergy antibody. That's great information, and I hope that uh, the clinical trials prove to be a you know, positive outcome for those patients. There are some um, small case studies showing that it does work for individual patients, but again, the clinical trials really will give us the proper perspective of, you know, it doesn't really work in a broad sense. All right. Thank you, Mr. Zellener. We have our next question by Elizabeth. Is there any truth in certain blood groups being less likely to get alpha-gal? Uh, for example, the B blood group. There was a doctor in St. Louis that published that article about B blood group being protective. And Dr. Platts Mills said it's because it's a similar structure to alpha-gal. So a fewer percentage of people with the B blood group have alpha-gal, but they can still have it. Thank you. And is it common to develop extra food allergies after alpha-gal, or is this like mast cell activation syndrome being triggered? And this was asked by Micah. Um, my observation has been that some patients do develop other food allergies. So I had someone who had a very high positive alpha gal who developed an allergy to almond. So she couldn't use almond milk because she was also dairy allergic. Um, but I don't know the percentage of patients who have developed other food allergies. And then the mast cells, there's another article um, out of St. Louis, a different group, um, where they talked about mast cells being hyperactive with alpha gal. And so I'll be interested to see what they come out with about that, because I, I do observe that, that people's mast cells can become hyperactive and they become more sensitive to other things. And there's also, I don't, I don't believe there's any current research on it, but I think there's some kind of at least a hypothesis, but um, it seems to have some type of an association as well with other tick-borne diseases and mast cell patients triggering, triggering um, mast cell in them. Uh, another question for Dr. Merritt asked by Daniel, if you were reacting to magnesium sterate in medication, what can a patient do? Any strategies for getting in uh, to cover these safe medications? Well, some of my patients, when they don't have a pharmacy that can find a safe form of their medication, have to get it compounded. The problem with that is insurance usually doesn't cover compounding costs. And so I think that would be a good push um, for the community to also push for insurance to cover compounding and safe medications. I have to take a vitamin that's prescription, L-methylfolate, 
and it's safe. I found out it, it's a pill, but it doesn't have magnesium stearate in the one I get, but my insurance will not cover it. And I've had to try and tell them, well, I need this because I'm you know, vitamin deficient because of my diet and they still will not cover it. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Merritt. Um, we have, I'm, I'm gonna skip through a couple here because it was um, addressed to Dr. Merritt as well, or, um, and I'm, I'm at, it wasn't addressed, but I'm asking because, um, because you know, Dr. Uh, Platts Mills. So Daniel noted that um, their hus um, husband and I are seeing Dr. Platts Mills soon. Any suggestions on making the most of the appointment? Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Platts Mills is very approachable, very nice. Um, I'm sure that the people that train with him are also going to have useful information. Um, what usually happens is you'll see a fellow in training first, and then Dr. Platts Mills will come in. So if you do have a list of questions ready, I think that would be helpful. Okay. And let's see. So some of this will be for... Um, for the general panelists. Uh, Candice um, noted that um, they are interested in um, having a maybe a database included for all ingredients, um, as much ingredients as possible for allergies is available to select inside uh, traditional allergy panels. Um, maybe for instance, on Amazon, for the drop down list of ingredients and they would like to know how they can get this idea to major retailers. So this might be a great question for maybe Beth yep. or you know. So that's an excellent question. Um, I love the extra thoughtful stuff that that uh, participant asked about regarding um, drop down menus online. So right now um, there is a push to make, you know, the printed packaging and online some, you know, um, succinct. So that way, as you're shopping, you know, we're not make, accidentally making mistakes and making incorrect purchases for ourselves. So that, that was something that was missed um, years ago when we first started labeling foods. So that's the good news. Uh, so hopefully you'll see that. But first we have to identify everywhere that alpha-gal is, where it's a problem, right? And then get um, the, it li uh, listed as a, one of the top allergens here in the US. When that happens, then labeling, hopefully by the time that comes to fruition, the part, uh, the piece with online labeling will be also ironed out at that point. That's my hope. But uh, that is a very, uh, that's a very keen eye that someone has because it can be tricky. Sometimes the labeling, you know, different sources, um, the food and product might come from a different vendor and they might use different ingredient sources. So, you know, place that you normally buy this one package of food might be manufactured a little bit differently elsewhere. So it's, it's really important we get this labeling piece nailed down. Thank you, Beth. Like a war, uh, like Amanda's example, right? Of the tortillas with the sugar. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Beth, this question is directed to you. As someone who often travels for work, what strategies do you recommend, especially with catering and banquet? Um, I am very excited to answer this one. As a mother who had a uh, a spouse at one point and my children, we had over 30 food allergies and uh, Debbie and two gals here, you guys would be, uh, ladies be happy to know, I did not put the brakes on my life. I would not allow that. Um, I had to figure it out long before labeling was in effect. My son was diagnosed with a peanut allergy and then things progressed from there. We had over 30 food allergies and I was last with alpha gal. So I travel a lot, my kids were involved in sports and Boy Scouts, you know, out in the woods, camping trips, the Washington big DC trip that they take in eighth grade, um, you know, school activities, church activities, plan, plan and plan some more. That's my best advice, be prepared and be 
ready, you know, you're going there to church or you're going to your friend's birthday party, you know, at their house or a restaurant or something, if it's safe for you to be in that environment, that's what it's about. It's about that event, right? So maybe eat ahead. So that way when you're there, maybe you could get a salad. Maybe you could just say, I'm eating dessert first. And maybe you found a safe dessert. What I like to do um, for dining out, I call ahead. And if I can, I actually show up if it's not a restaurant I'm familiar with. And I tell the restaurant, it, you know, if it was a good experience and I know I'm going to be back, I make sure that they keep my information on hand in the back because we will go keep going back. But when you're traveling like on a plane or, you know, something like that, and you're, you're less in control, um, I visit the grocery stores, right? Or I do DoorDash or something like that, like, or um, not DoorDash. Um, oh gosh, I'm thinking the grocery store app. I'm trying to think of the grocery store app that I use. Um, you can just call in. And, you know, what is it? Instacite. Thank you. I don't know why I was dropping a ball. But you can call up Instacart, right? Go to a grocery store in your area. You could have it delivered to your hotel room. You could have it ready for pickup. I have done that on numerous occasions. I ask for a refrigerator. It's a medical need. They almost always accommodate. I haven't had a problem before. But if you prepare and have that in, in your possession in advance, um, it's really going to be your best outcome because there's going to be those trips when you're on the plane and you open up the sandwich you just grabbed, you know, as you're running through the gate and it's labeled chicken salad and it has all the ingredients, but when you unfold it, there's bacon inside of it. That did happen to me once and I had to sit through the flight empty handed, you know, so because the peanuts actually had a gelatin um, uh, spraying on it, you know, for the flavoring and salt to stick. So I couldn't even have the peanuts that were on the plane, which I would love to see them take off for food allergies in general. But uh, that's what I just say, plan, plan and plan some more. Thank you, Beth. Uh, some of these questions I do see that panelists are typing answers, so I'm going to skip a little around um, and jump ahead, but one of them uh, is directed to Amanda, and it does say that Amanda's typing an answer, but it is such an important question, especially when it comes to accessibility and equity um, in the tick-borne disease community. Um, is there any data about alpha-gal and communities of color and food access? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for asking this question because it is really important. And um, what I can say is that as far as I know, um, and speaking with uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Platt, the data that came back from the large survey that they did also reflects what I currently know and that, that, that there is very little um, information about um, um, communities of color, indigenous communities, et cetera, and what their association with alpha-gal is. So it'd be really hard to say that there's, you know, data about food access as well. If we don't, if we don't have the AG data, we certainly can't have the food access data, but there's work to be done. Um, and thank you for, you know, for bringing that to light, because I think eliminating that sort of can change the direction of how data is collected and what questions we ask when we're collecting that data. So that's really important. Thank you so much. If I can oh. maybe add just a couple more comments, there's a whole section of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group report to Congress this time that is addressing equity and the you know incredible gaps of information that we have. And I don't say incredible in a good way. I mean, as you know, dearth of information. Um, so it's very much on the radar of the current administration is to incorporate equity and to address um, the lack of information that we have. As we know, there's already uh, inequities in our you know, public health and uh, clinical systems. And of course, if there are communities that um, aren't being tested, um, that drives that uh, gap wider. But I also believe it starts with clinical education, right? The clinicians uh, need to be educated and the clinicians in those communities so they can look for those symptoms and 
test more, kind of at least start there. All right. So Lisa uh, mentioned that they get hives from eating mammalian flesh, but is asymptomatic when eating dairy or taking supplements with magnesium stearate. Should they discontinue these anyway because of concerns about subclinical presentation, which could negatively affect their body? Um, or um, And they've recently heard also that subclinical AGS is linked to coronary artery disease. Um, so with the coronary artery disease, Dr. Platts Mills and Dr. Wilson in the United States published and then Australia published, but a low positive alpha-gal is associated with developing atherosclerosis, which is the plaque in the arteries. And so I've had patients that were low positive and not very symptomatic and ready to go eat again. And I, I had to point that out to them that there's still possibly a risk of developing other diseases that they may not realize are having symptoms. And then with not having symptoms with dairy, um, that recent number was 65% have reported a dairy allergy, which means that you may be in the 45% that doesn't. But I do recommend checking the milk IgE whenever they check your alpha-gal again. Um, a lot of doctors don't check milk, and, and I always do, because I think it's probably around 50 to 60% of patients have milk symptoms. And then with the magnesium stearate, we don't really have a test for that. It's a very small amount of alpha-gal, but some of us are symptomatic. And the symptoms may not be as severe, but um, some patients do have symptoms with magnesium stearate. Mine was being dizzy every day I took this pill and it was just dizzy. And so they thought I was having a migraine variant. And you know, finally, when I realized what it was and the dizziness went away. So your symptoms may be different, um, but I would definitely monitor for symptoms before you continue a medication that has alpha-gal. And on, on this direct topic, Nancy asks, if you're not dairy reactive, should you still avoid it? Does it harm the body to continue ingesting dairy or gelatin? Um, we don't know, but again, I would get tested. Um, we normally consider a milk allergy of a class two or higher significant, but I was a class two in college and would have mild symptoms and I just cut it out. And then I was able to eat milk again when it went to negative, and now I'm having symptoms with milk again. So I'm basing it on my symptoms, not on the test, but I recommend getting a test. And if your test is a class two or higher, I would avoid it. And Paul notes that um, reactivity is unpredictable. Uh, their wife's IgE anti-alpha-gal was once 99. Now it is 2.3 and she can eat dairy without a reaction. To Paul's surprise, as a professor of immunology at Dartmouth, um, she can now eat Ben and Jerry's. Very important, don't try Ben and Jerry's <laughs> unless you have an inhaler, an EpiPen. <laughs> That's great advice, Paul, thank you. Okay, so um, Danielle asks, um, are there any strategies for fun eating when you have celiac and alpha-gal syndrome? Would that be a question for Amanda? Yeah, I was um, just answering that. Actually, I was typing it. Um, okay, I was going to so say, I think that would be great for Amanda. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, you know, obviously embracing the new um, because we do have to learn to explore, you know, new foods and new ways of eating. Um, definitely using fresh herbs and spices, um, exploring, exploring those opportunities to try new fresh herbs, um, to try to make your own spice blends, things like that. And I also think that if you have a, a good support network, whether it's through friends, family, whatever, create those spaces where you can cook these meals together, where you make it a family project or a friend project. Um, hey, I found this great new recipe. Um, I think it's going to work for everything that I'm dealing with. Would you all like to come over and help me put this together? Um, you know, and, and, you know, try to uh, be creative in, in how you think about, you know, not only trying new recipes, but how you put these recipes together. So you're not just alone in a kitchen trying to figure out, you know, multiple um, new ways to eat. Um, those are just some ideas. Does anyone else have ideas? 
I was just going to say, I've had a wheat allergy for 15 years and Debbie's also really sensitive to gluten. So we're happy to share. We, we have a lot of product recommendations on the gluten-free side, as long as, Al, you know, as well as Alpha-Gal. So anyone feel free to reach out. That's kind of, that's our life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. So I'm going to direct this next question to Mr. Zellener. I'm, un, I'm unsure at the moment if um, if he has an answer. Uh, but Courtney asked, "Do you think this is, uh, that alpha gal syndrome is associated with other tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease because Lyme expresses alpha gal as part of its survival strategy?" Per Dr. Shahid Kareem's 2021 paper. Um, well, we do know just like the red algae that produces alpha-gal uh, and gets turned into carrageenan. Uh, there are fungi and bacteria that also, and parasites that produce alpha-gal. It's not really just a mammalian source thing, but in many of those cases, the concentrations are quite low. And looking at the epidemiology of alpha-gal, at least to the extent that we know it, it doesn't seem to be that you know the there are fewer cases of alpha gal in the deer tick territories uh, where Lyme is more common than there are in the Lone Star tick territories. So if there's a connection uh, with the bacterial exposure also making people more sensitive to alpha gal, it's hard to discern from that data. Uh, it would be a very faint and weak connection at that. Um, but that's really the best answer we can give right now without uh, understanding a lot more about, you know, how alpha-gal, like the full sensitization process and all the other factors and risk factors involved um, and isolating, you know, the deer tick cases and cases where people have Lyme as well. Uh, and it doesn't stand out in that survey data. Uh, from TBC United, you know, where people report of the overlap between uh, alpha gal and Lyme versus, say, alpha gal and Rocky Mountain spotted fever or other tick diseases. Thank you, Mr. Zellner. And that kind of actually leads um, into another question here that um, someone did mention about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but I'm going to um, ask Dr. Merritt this question uh, because it is for, um, it is asking about treatment. May, um, so Des mentions that they're wondering if there's any homeopathic treatments that have shown promise in the treatment of alpha-gal as well as other tick-borne diseases, uh, such as maybe methane blue, as I'm aware it's hopeful with Rocky Mountain spotted fever, if not applicable, what's credited for the remissions mentioned? Methane blue, except that's used for a stain when I was in microbiology, so I'm not quite sure. But um, for treatments right now, I'm more familiar with the antibiotics if you have a tick infection. And I usually recommend getting either a good antibiotic I'm sorry, Dr. Merritt, your, your audio is breaking up a bit. I'm oh, sorry. That tells me my video goes off. Can you hear me better now? Okay. So um, with antibiotics being used for doxycycline to get a little make sure it doesn't have mammal ingredients. And then there are some other treatments out there for alpha. Yeah, we have a, a bad audio connection, Dr. Merritt. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Would you be able to type um, to type it in the box, maybe in the chat box, if possible? Would you mind? So um, we will. Um, Sorry about the audio. Um, there might be some connectivity issues. Um, I have a, I actually have a few more questions um, for Dr. Merritt. Um, so I will ask um, a couple others um, while that one's being answered in the box and then see if maybe the audio is um, connecting back. So 
Charles asks, who, if anyone, is leading research into treatments or clinical trials? And who is leading fundraising for such research or trials? With more cases, are any farm companies interested in this issue? Um, Charles notes that they think there's an opportunity to approach um, certain industry groups, such as the National Cattlemen's Association, National Dairy Council, pork producers, and others who stand to gain from avoiding a loss of market as more consumers are impacted by AGS. Um, I know that um, Beth has some information on some clinical trials, um, maybe also Dr. Platt. I'd like to first note that typically a lot of funding does come, obviously, um, you know, from the government itself. Um, we have a lot of funding that is now being appropriated for tick-borne diseases, um, as Dr. Uh, Platt and um, Ms. Carrison mentioned about advocacy work. Um, with um, with the Center for Lyme Action and uh, the government now um, adding additional research funding for DOD and NIH funding. But I will turn it over to Beth. Okay, so I'm going to ask Jennifer to jump in on this as well, but just go back to this whole process. First, we're moving along really fast in comparison, but it is still a very lengthy process. So think back, right? So first we presented, there was a problem, got shut down. Presented again, accepted. It took that whole next year for everything to be documented, discussed and proven just to start entering in the conversations of AlphaGal in 2018. Then, the Center for Lyme Action forms, and there's this rally to pull together all these, you know, nonprofits and stakeholders to go after that funding. It really, actually, first to go after getting um, those recommendations into the legislation, right? Like get a bill together, and so we worked. We get the K Hagen Tick Act going, and that goes through. Now somebody has to pay for that. So now there's a whole other cycle that goes into that, but also that is a repetitive cycle every year we're asking for money to stay on vector-borne diseases and you know which includes alpha-gal syndrome and such so it's a really long process yes absolutely um the cattlemen's association i'm sure out beef industry they've weighed in right um steve troxler is the north carolina agricultural commissioner and he was diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome and we've all said it's going to take somebody with some significant clout to, to help out. So he was wonderful. He says, man, I am just mad about this. Nobody, you know, nothing's being done. What do we do? And before we knew it, Mr. Troxler dedicated a half day food safety forum and Revivacor came in. And those are the folks that have been working on, you know, genetically modifying or modifying the pigs so that they can be used for um, xenotransplantation and other medical uses, but they also saw the opportunity and really felt bad for us. <laughs> you know, we want a burger and a steak and bacon and things like that. So they they were looked into how do we make these pigs useful for food as well. So here we have, you know, somebody very influential now advocating right for us and making those inroads in the FDA and all the other organizations that we need in support for food labeling and funding and research and, and so forth. So um, it's taking a while. I think there's so many different universities that are getting funding. Um, there's also LimeX that's out there uh, that's you know working on funding. They had uh, Stephen Alexander Cohen Foundation, largest private donation, working with our country to pull together a better system for um, everything that's involved in tick-borne illness. They're yeah. currently working on a diagnostic challenge, right? So, which is awesome with the DA. Yeah, Jennifer, if you just want to quick chime in on any, any of that. Yeah, the only other thing I would add to your comments are the NIH has done some funding on alpha-gal research for Dr. Scott Common's lab at UNC. And the UNC Development Department is doing fundraising as well for his research. So that's another place that is, you know, alpha-gal specific, as well as the Southeastern um, Tick 
center of excellence out of Florida is now doing some alpha-gal funded research. So those are initiatives. And I will take this opportunity to mention again, the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group is still meeting. There, the next meeting is on October 4th and 5th. There will be an opportunity at that meeting for public comments. So um, uh, stay, you know, that's a very easy site to Google by putting in TBDWG because there's not any other <laughs> sites that have that acronym. Um, so you can watch there, you can watch our Facebook page and the other way to send in a message to them is to email tickborne disease at hhs.gov. I'm on the public comment subcommittee. We're writing a report based on all the comments that have come in, not only right now, but over the past six years. And we'll be presenting that, but we take those comments very seriously. Thank you much, Dr. Platt. Yes, the more that we all educate and advocate as we're able, right? Because a lot of people on this call may be patients as well, um, or have other constraints or are caregivers uh, to patients at home. So thank you everyone for being here. I would like to take the last um, moment as I'm uh, just wrapping up um, and ask Heather or anyone else if you guys would like to put your information in the comments, um, if anyone would like to reach out to you guys. Um, I hope that everyone learned a great deal about the latest on alpha-gal syndrome and benefited from the discussion of coping strategies and life adaptations. Tick diseases and syndromes are dangerous and can be deadly. So uh, let's all continue to advocate for awareness and prevention methods um, with your friends and family and anyone you know. Thank you again for everyone attending this event. Please feel free to follow Lime TV, Tick, uh, TBC United, Two Alpha Gals, and the rest of the panelists to stay up to date with resources. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Stay in touch. Drag it together. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.